Well, a very good morning to you all, ladies and gentlemen. I feel I've really made it in politics. I see I've been sponsored by somebody. I've been looking for sponsorship all my political life, and I've now got it. Um, I'm going to do the cheap and easy and almost nasty thing today, and that is a, a presentation that I gave to the ESRI conference in San Diego uh, last month, which went down really well with an international audience, and it's all to do with the power of geospatial in times of a disaster. So I thought I would repeat that again, if I could. I apologise for those of you who are from New Zealand who will know some of this, although I don't think it hurts to get a bit of a refresh about some of the things that went on. And for those of you who are international guests, in fact, I found quite amazing in San Diego at an ESRI conference, people who do world maps and use mapping technology, some of them didn't know where Christchurch was, and others didn't know that Christchurch had even had an earthquake. So I'm going to take you through a little bit of stuff about the power of geospatial, and hopefully that will answer a number of questions you have about it. Can I start with a little bit about what a beautiful, quiet, placid, lovely place Christchurch was? And hopefully it'll set the scene for you for what's about to come. Hunting on the Avon, beachside, beach frontage, and beautiful buildings. But then, more than 10,000 earthquakes, four of them huge, hit in September of 2010, February of 2011, which was the biggie, um, and June of 2011, and December of 2011. So, a city of Christchurch that looked like this from the Port Hills. Actually, no, I'm going to show you a couple of slides more than that first. First of all, I want to show you where the two uh, important ones were. The September of 2010 quake occurred here. So quite a way out from the city. And the big February quake occurred right in here. Pretty much unexpected, actually, given the, the uh, big uh, fault line. The Alpine fault line lies somewhere up here. Uh, in the actual foothills of the Southern Alps. So, this I think will put it in perspective as to how much energy was released on the 22nd of February. It was equivalent of 50,000 Hiroshima bombs exploding simultaneously, or over half a year of New Zealand's total energy consumption. Uh, there's where the epicentre was, just to the southeast, slightly down near Port Littleton from the central city. The shaking was quite amazing. We, we had vertical ground shaking of 2.2 Gs. That means buildings weighed 2.2 times their normal weight during that vertical acceleration. And it was some of the highest ever recorded in the history of the planet. It was more than four times greater than the highest accelerations recorded in the big Japanese earthquake that followed a month later. So I think now if you look from the beautiful Port Hills and just share with me some of the imagery of Christchurch before I get into the key part of my speech, I think it'll bring it home for you. That was the view from the Port Hills a few seconds later. A few before and after shots, the Avon River before. the Catholic Basilica before and after, Canterbury Cathedral and other buildings which are now since gone altogether. I'm just going to let these just run by themselves for a few minutes.
And uh, those of you who are international guests from China and Taiwan and from uh, Japan and from the United States and Australia, we thank you very much for the huge support that the international community gave New Zealand. And as you saw, we rescued 69 people alive from that huge chunk of debris. So to the stuff that you're interested in with regards to the geospatial tools, well, let me first show you the enormous levels of ground displacement that occurred. This was on the September 4 quake. That was on the February quake. And that was on the June quake. And when you add them all together, we had massive, massive, in a clockwise uh, case, really huge uh, movement of the land and both vertical and in terms of lateral spreading. So we live on a very delicate planet which can take a, quite a buckling from time to time, as did the whole of the landscape in that area. And we have a new project involved down there in resetting all the geodetic domes and recalibrating all of the land. We also used uh, very quickly on some very high quality aerial imagery to work out what was happening after the 22nd quake and, and to use it accordingly. Uh, sites of the, you can see the streets with liquefaction right throughout the suburbs. Uh, there are the buses that you saw the down on the ground view of sitting there in the roadside. Uh, that's the Canterbury Cathedral from above with the, spot, the tower all gone, the main part of the cathedral here. Uh, the building that I think I showed you that has gone all together, that was here, that one there. And so aerial imagery provided a, a phenomenal, that's the bowling club that were nothing but green lawns and bowling greens and now just severe liquefaction. It was a term that came into the lexicon for most New Zealanders that had never heard the word before. Um, that, that's the Pine Gould building there, just by the little band rotunda on the river. So the aerial imagery of the Port Hills collapsing here, shearing away and down into the school grounds uh, were very valuable. So some practical examples of the power of GIS, because this is what it really comes down to. We were able to get maps up and running very quickly of uh, where the meters were being read and where they were working and where the meters weren't getting any electricity through to them so we could tell huge amount of devastation around. Here's the river running through here. So just things like some real powerful use of crowdsourcing such as things like the, electronic, the electricity meters and things like cell phone towers showing where there was movement of vehicular traffic and where there wasn't. Uh, we set up a website that allowed people to go in and look at uh, their part of the world and look at everything we knew about everything. Uh, you could click on the map icons and look at various bits and pieces. Here's Orion's map showing still parts of just off here to the east of the CBD. Well, actually, that is in the CBD there because there's Hagley Park, but then off to the east and out through to here where there is still no electricity uh, showing as being registered. So phenomenal mapping powers that were able to be brought together in centralised uh, processing of. Here's some stuff about uh, roads. Uh, with weight restrictions shown in blue, roads that were closed altogether in red, bridges that were closed, red bridges, etc. So you can see again the transportation corridors were really quickly under control so we could tell. Uh, that says last updated in July of 2012 but we had those running very quickly after the February quake and then that's obviously after the June uh, quake in 2011 as well. But that's where we are right now, and you can look at, map, at bridges which have still got work to be done and so on. Uh, for homeowners, you could go into any one particular uh, parcel of land. So this is 38 Hillsborough Terrace, and you could see its zoning, its green zoned, its technical classification, and its land status. So again, using geospatial tools and land map tools, we were able to get some phenomenally good information to people as quickly as it was possible to give into their hands. Um, both residential and land zoning and CBD red zoning. So here's Sarah 
uh, the Canterbury Earthquake Recovery Authority, which is a government agency we set up after it, which is trying to uh, quantify the land, so what land is zoned red and not to be built on again, what land is orange for further consideration, what has got green and been uh, allocated. So you can see a lot of the land by that stage had been done. That maps, um, well, it's got the various dates sitting down here on them as to when they were done. And uh, the most recent one of those looks more like this. We're down to pretty much just a bit of white zone stuff from time to time, but the vast bulk of it's either been zoned green or indeed red for not use again. That was the four avenues that were blocked off straight after because of the huge uh, damage to the commercial centre of Christchurch. Uh, I think 1,200 buildings uh, need to be demolished, of which the vast bulk are now down, including imploding uh, some buildings of recent times, but having to pick some of the bigger buildings like um, uh, the, the hotel, the Grand Chancellor Hotel, having to pick it from the very top brick by brick because if you had imploded that from the base, the, the collateral damage to other buildings in the area would have been just huge. So that's the original red zone for the CBD as it was uh, fenced off and patrolled by the military. We're now down to this and uh, hopefully, hopefully opening even more in, in quite soon. Uh, there's the categorisation of the lands category, so you can see up here uh, grey being technical category 1, the mustard being technical category 2, technical category 3, so all of the land now being categorised because I have another portfolio in the government as Minister of Building and Construction and a lot of the rebuild there in terms of the foundation requirements for the land and indeed the actual design of the foundations required very technical detail of that land so we know what can be built on and what you can do with it and there's some really valuable stuff in there about that technical category of land. Again something that even a few years ago wouldn't have been available in the map graphical geospatial format that we are now getting stuff. As I said before crowdsourced data from cell phone towers and others showing areas where there was no usage at all and other areas where there were high usage so we could uh, go in and look at uh, and actually have people put in information about property damage as they spotted it and uh, what they were seeing and where they were seeing it and what information they could. Uh, the rebuilding of Christchurch images finally just to say to you that ever since Christchurch was built we've always had some maps they were pretty antiquated and old-fashioned back in 1850 uh, but gradually over time we've added more and more value and now as we do the rebuild of Christchurch, all of that rebuild will use maps that are very highly technical, which will allow us to go in and zone various zones for health use or for recreational use or for commercial use. And so we've probably got the, the best chance of ever of actually building a new city using digital earth technologies and, and using geospatial tools. So. Um, Here's our skirt spatial viewer, uh, and in this viewer we are able to go into streets, look at each of the individual land parcels, and by clicking on any one of these, get a specific categorisation of exactly what your property is doing right now, what the infrastructure is doing in terms of water, sewerage, mains, etc. Um, the skirt viewer allows you to take this and look at transportation, communications uh, and uh, water, so infrastructure across the roading water and telecommunications infrastructure as to where it is still working, uh, where there are still areas of blockages and not working and where there are areas that are working but with restrictions and limitations. And I think if I go back to this one here, you're able to, or maybe the next skirt shot I think, you're able to go back and, and place the cursor on any one of the dots on here, this one here. And any one of these represents elements of infrastructure. Remember a lot of the water is actually gravity fed, so if you had one end of a pipe lift above the other end when it was lower in the past, instead of the water being fed to where it's going, it's gonna flow back, and similarly for sewerage systems and so on. And so every one of those little nodes allows you to go and just click on it, get a balloon up and see what is the story, what is the case right now, 
what is happening and so on. So in summary, um, it was a big event for us. It was estimated to be around 20 billion of damage and probably more, 9.5% of our GDP and 3.2% of the nation's capital stock completely written out. Uh, it resulted in the loss of 185 lives, but can I say without the CTV building, and I think it's really important to keep emphasising this, it wasn't built to standard, it wasn't built to code, and it didn't even meet the building code of the year it was built in, so there's some question marks around that. Without the 115 that died in that tragedy, our loss of life for a cataclysmic event with probably the highest level of vertical ground shaking ever recorded on the planet was actually very low. So the geospatial tools we use were phenomenally valuable and without them I believe the response, the recovery and indeed the rebuild will have all been disasters in their, cell, in their own right. So I am, for those of you who are from overseas and haven't heard me give my little religious message, I am a new believer in the geospatial tools out there. I am a believer that the world needs to get hold of this revolution and start adding enormous value to it. Digital Earth doesn't mean anything just in itself, but with the value of tools and solutions and products that can be added to it, we will finally be able to do some pretty stunning things. I keep saying to my colleagues in the, in the government, it worries me that every other data element that I give you, like a date, the 26th of October 2011, or an amount of money, 4,300 US dollars, or a weight of a product, 405 tonnes of wheat, every one of those elements on a spreadsheet, you would know what they meant. But if I then had an element at the beginning row called Kaikoura, what is it? Is it a town? Is it an area? Is it a region? Is it the whole lot? Who knows? And for my view, the new technologies of geospatial will allow us to, as decision makers and people looking for information, go in and look at really, really high quality maps. And instead of, as we publish right now, alphabetical Auckland, Blenheim, Christchurch, Dargaville, which mean nothing because they don't even, for those of you who are from overseas, they're not even close to each other, uh, because they're alphabetical, seems a crazy way to represent data, but to go in and geographically look at the city of Auckland or the suburbs of Auckland or a particular sub-part of Auckland uh, is important. So I, I need to emphasise very strongly with you that geospatial was an absolute lifesaver for us in each of those, and, and will be even more so in the third of those, the rebuild as we go. Uh, and it's just wonderful that we sit in a time in history where, as we saw before from our friend from China showing the satellite coverage and the information that we know and the ability to calibrate our Earth is getting so strong and the high quality imagery that we can map onto that is so good. So thank you very much.